25 seconds until 7 p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Bulova Watch Time. Bulova invites you to see His Excellency, America's greatest watch value, leader of your jeweler's 1948 watch parade. Next on KNX, The Razor's Edge with Mark Stevens and Ida Lupino. And stay tuned for My Friend Irma at 8. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you... The Lux Radio Theater, starring Ida Lupino and Mark Stevens in The Razor's Edge. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. We're always proud to present a play based on one of Somerset Maugham's stories, because his name assures us of romance and mystery and adventure. No living writer has been enjoyed more by the reading public, and as a result, Mr. Maugham's novels are invariably on the bestseller list. Tonight, in the 20th Century Fox picture, The Razor's Edge, we have one of his masterpieces, with Ida Lupino and Mark Stevens as our stars. In book form, The Razor's Edge sold something more than two million copies, and Darrell F. Zanuck's film production was seen by perhaps 40 million more. Truly a bestseller. And tonight, when 20 or 25 million people hear the story again, it's brought to you by another bestseller, Lux Toilet Soap. And like any bestseller, quality is responsible for the success of Lux Toilet Soap. The curtain rises on the raises of Lupino as Isabel and Mark Stevens as Larry. <laughs> These are my recollections of a very unusual young man with whom I was thrown into contact at long intervals. He's not famous. It even may be that when his life is over, he will leave no more trace of his sojourn on this earth than a stone thrown in a river leaves on the surface of the water. And yet, I met him first in the summer of 1919 in Chicago. A friend of mine, Elliot Templeton, whom I'd known in Paris, invited me to a sort of family dinner party at a country club. Oh, there you are, Norm. Welcome to this benighted city. Let me present my sister, Louisa, Mr. Somerset Maugham, my sister, Mrs. Brad. How do you do? He's really quite famous abroad, Louisa. So pretend you know all his books. Oh. <laughs> well, how much longer must we wait for dinner? Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll try to find out about it now. Of course. Oh, I should never have left Paris. Well, why did you? To visit Louisa and Isabel. Oh, Isabel is my niece, Louisa's daughter. She's around here somewhere. I'd like to meet her. You'll also meet her young man. His name is Larry Darrell, and I don't approve of him. Oh, I have nothing against him, but he hasn't any money. We can't all be millionaires. The fellow hasn't even got a job. He doesn't want one. But that must be a great shock to a man like you, Elliot, who's never earned a penny in his life. <laughs> it may have escaped your notice, my dear fellow, but I am not an ordinary man. The run of mankind, industry is essential. Oh, there's Isabel now. She's very lovely. And that other girl? Her name is Sophie Nelson, a sort of country cousin. Well, come, I rather think I require a costume. A few minutes later, seeing that Sophie was alone, I walked over and introduced myself. Quite a party, isn't it, Mr. Morgan? Oh, I wish I had a drink. Well, let me bring you one. <laughs> Don't tempt me. I promised Bob I wouldn't. Bob? My fiance. He doesn't like you to come. Now, which one here is Bob? Oh, he hasn't arrived. You see, he's putting himself through law school and he doesn't finish till late. Mr. Mom, you're a great friend of Mr. Templeton's aunt. Elliot has no friends, my dear. Only acquaintances. <laughs> he's an awful snob, isn't he? Awful. But he's kind and generous. In Paris, people laugh at him behind his back, but they never hesitate to drink his wine and eat his food. Oh, uh... Is that Mr. Darrow there with Isabel? Oh, no, that's Gray. Gray Maturin. His father's a millionaire stockbroker. He gives a talk. I see. Gray's really wonderful. And he's so much in love with Isabel, he can't speak to her. And she's in love with Larry Darrow. Mm -hmm. I suppose that would complicate matters. Oh, speaking of Larry, there he is now. Come, Mr. Mom, I'll introduce you. Everybody knows everybody. What's the trouble, brown eyes? 
your nerves. Oh, of course I am, Lawrence. I'm waiting for Bob. A tall, dark, and legal standing you up. Oh, I'd like to catch him trying it, Isabel. Now be nice and small. Your old friends, Mr. Darrow, you and Sophie? They grew up together, Mr. Morm. Sophie was probably the best shortstop our neighborhood ever had. Mr. Morm, since you're a novelist, I better warn you that Larry's very stupid. He knows nothing about anything but flying. But when he came back from the war, he looked so lovely in his uniform. I just camped on his doorstep until he consented to marry me. The competition was awful. Isabel's not a bad girl, Mr. Mom. She's just a terrible liar. Larry, I think we've time for dance before dinner. Will you excuse us, Mr. Mom? Of course, we're on a lot. you wanted to dance. Wanted to be with you alone. Only for a minute. Kiss me. I have every intention of doing exactly that. Well, Larry, about the job Gray's father offered you. Are you mad because I didn't accept it? Well, after all, a man must work. The longer you put it off, the harder it will be. Well, I'd like to do more with my life than sell bonds, Isabel. What, Larry? Oh, I don't know. Look, maybe. Oh, no, don't be funny, darling. This is serious. I think it's very serious. Darling, let's be sensible. This is a young country, and there never were such great opportunities. I'm sure you're right. But it just happens that making money doesn't interest me as much as it should. But, Larry, you can't live without money. But I have a little. That's what gives me the chance to do what I want, Isabel. The dead look so terribly dead when they're dead. What does that mean? Just that. Are you so terribly unhappy, darling? The only thing that makes me unhappy is making you unhappy. Maybe it would be better just to follow the beaten path. And that's what's coming to me come. But then I think of a fellow I knew. The last day of the war. He could have saved himself, but he didn't. He saved me and he died. He's gone, and I'm here alive. Why? It's all so meaningless. I can't help but ask myself what life is all about. Whether there's any sense to it or whether it's just a stupid blunder. Barry. But it helps if you went away for a while. I think perhaps it would. Then why don't you go? You mean you... You want to break our engagement? No, darling, of course not. I only mean I'm prepared to wait. That's what you want? It might be a year, Isabel. Even longer. Might also be less. Where have you thought of going, now? Well, I... Well, Paris. I don't know why, but I've got it into my head that maybe in Paris... Everything that's muddled in my mind would grow clear. And if it doesn't grow clear? Well, I'll give it all up and take the first job I can get. Oh, my darling. I love you, Larry. I love you so much. Oh, hello, Uncle Ellie. Isabel? Well, I thought you were still cavorting at that horrible country club. What's the matter? And where's Larry? Hmm? He dropped me off and fled. Hello, Mr. Morn. Your uncle insisted on bringing me home for a brandy. He thinks... Uh, just a moment. Uh, Isabel, about Larry, did you have a talk with him? Yes. Well, may I venture to inquire the result? Larry's decided to go to Paris for a while. Why? To loaf. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Oh, that's what he told me. Really, if you had any spirit, you'd have broken the engagement. Hmm. What can I do? I love him. Mr. Morn, I'm sorry to have inflicted this on you, but you know Uncle Elliot. Well, uh, I'll say good night. Good night, Isabel. <laughs> you think I'm upset, don't you, Morn? You've made it fairly obvious. Well, I'm not upset at all. In Europe, Darrell will be out of the way. And I don't see why Isabel shouldn't marry Gray Maturin before the year is out. You've lived in France so long, Elliot. You've forgotten that in this country, a girl doesn't marry a man because her mother... Or even her rich and worldly uncle wants her to. You know, I don't mind admitting I have a sneaking sympathy for this Daryl fellow. I keep my eye on him in Paris. I look for an apartment at a really smart quarter. Oh, I'll do him proud. I'll lend him the rose and I show fur now and then. Yes, Mom, I may even make Daryl my protege. Poor Elliot. All the wonderful things he was going to do for Larry in Paris. Unfortunately, Larry would have none of it. And Elliot flicked him off like a speck of lint in his impeccable lapel. Larry spent his year in France. Then, quite suddenly, Isabel and her mother arrived. Now, don't look so unpleasant, Uncle Elliot. Of course I'll see Larry. Darling, don't be hurt. But I didn't come to Paris just to see you. He met you at the boat, I suppose. Oh, and it was wonderful to see him again. 
Mother, doesn't Larry look marvelous? I must admit, Isabel, he thrives beautifully in your absence. Indeed. Well, I haven't a very good account of that young man. Oh? When he first arrived in Paris, I invited him to a luncheon. I planned to introduce him to the Princess Nova Mali. He told me that he doesn't eat lunch. Perhaps he doesn't. And then when I asked him to dinner, he said he had no eating clothes. Maybe he just didn't want to come. That's the most incredible reason for refusing my invitation I've ever heard. Well, Louisa, how long are you and Isabel remaining? Oh, I don't know. We'll stay about a month, Uncle Elliot. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if Larry's with us on the boat back home. You tired of walking, Isabel? Oh, no, no. no. It's delightful. All these wonderful little shops and everything. Larry, do you know I've been here nearly a month? Impossible, darling. I've seen you every day, and I still don't know a thing about what you've done all year. Well, there's nothing to tell. Not really. I've traveled around the countryside, read a lot, gone to lectures. Well, that's about it. Have you found that piece of mind you were looking for? No. How much longer do you think all this is going to take? I don't know, Isabel. I'd ask for that. What are you going to do with all the wisdom you will acquire? Well, if I ever acquire wisdom, I suppose I'll be wise enough to know what to do with it. You know what Uncle Elliot says? <laughs> Nothing to my credit, I'm sure. Says you have a cozy little hideout somewhere. Oh, come and see for yourself. The cozy little hideout's only a step from here. In this neighborhood? But darling... Oh, Isabel, it only looks dirty. Come on. I'd like you to see it. A room four lights up. In a tenement. Oh, Larry. How can you bear to stay in this backwash when America is living through the most glorious adventure the world has ever known? You just can't go on loafing forever. How can you? Well, it's possible. Larry, am I of no importance to you at all? You're of great importance to me, Isabel. I want very much to marry you. When? Oh, ten years? No, now, as soon as possible. On what? Well, my folks left me what comes to about $3,000 a year. Oh, Larry. Well, lots of people live on a great deal less. But, darling, I don't want to live on $3,000 a year. I never have. I don't see why I should. Oh, listen. If you hadn't a cent to your name, but you got a job that brought you 3000 a year, I'd marry you without a moment's hesitation. I think it was fun, because I'd know it was only a question of time until you made good. But this means living like this all our lives, with nothing to look forward to. Larry. Larry, I'm begging you to come home. I wouldn't make you happy if I did. Oh, I know I'm being stubborn, vague, and difficult, but I, I can't stop now, Isabel. I can't. If I tried, I'd just make a mess of your life and mine, too. But what's all this going to lead to? Oh, I... I don't know, Isabel. Maybe nothing at all. But it may be that when I'm through, I'll find something to give that people will be glad to take. I mean, a way of life. Oh, I'm talking like a fool, and I know it. I'll probably fail. But if I do, I won't be any worse off than the fellow who's gone into business and hasn't made a go of it. I see. And there's nothing more to be said. Isabel, what are you doing? Giving you my engagement ring, Larry. Oh, you're all dressed up, Isabel. Where are you going? Oh, where in particular, Uncle Elliot? Larry and I are going out on the tongue. Larry? But you gave him up. Yes, dear, I know. But we thought we'd like to spend my last night in Paris together. If he had any sense of decency, he'd never ask you. I'm profoundly shocked. But he didn't ask me. I asked him. Louisa, you should forbid her to go. Will you pay any attention to me if I do, Isabel? No, darling, none. Well, in that case, Elliot, there's little point in forbidding. That's a lovely perfume she's wearing, Louisa. And that gown. She should never have bought it. Oh, I rather admire it. And I'm inclined to think she bought it for a very good reason. No doubt there were moments that night when Isabel and Larry forgot their engagement was ended. But most of their evening was sad and strained and filled with a yearning that neither music nor champagne could quite overcome. When Larry brought her back to Elliot's home... Five hours, you'll be on the boat train. How does one say goodbye, Isabel? Don't we say goodbye now, Larry? 
Stay for a moment. We could have one last drink together. I'd like to. Isabel, I... I've never seen you so beautiful. Oh, darling. Darling. Oh, what will I do without you? I love you so much I can't even... You better go. Larry, no, please, no. Don't kiss me again. Please, Larry. For heaven's sake, go. Goodbye, Isabel. Larry. That was a brilliant performance, my dear. Oh. Hello, Uncle Larry. I've been waiting in the next room. I left the door open just a little. <clears throat> you still want that drink? I expect you need it. Oh, you think you're very clever, don't you? Oh, come, come, child. I guess you were up to something. Even your poor mother noticed the pains you went to to make yourself particularly alluring tonight. You're hateful. Oh, but no fool, Monange. Isabel, you're a beautiful woman. You had him trapped just now. You know you did. Yes, I know. When I looked at him, when I saw you having the slightest idea, I, I just couldn't play such a dirty trick. I couldn't help myself. Oh, oh, it was my better nature. Nonsense. It was your sound Midwestern horse then. Isabel, in less than a year, you'll be Mrs. Gray Maturin with $20 million in the bank. I'll forget you, Larry. Within a year. I said less than a year. Trust your Uncle Elliot, my girl. He's a very wise old father. I wonder. I wonder. We'll continue with Act Two of The Razor's Edge. Now, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. Libby, you were saying that fact sometimes catches up with fiction. Sounds like you've uncovered something interesting. Yes, I have, Mr. Keeley. In the case of Universal International's recent picture, Rogue's Regiment. It's a story about the French Foreign Legion in Indochina and the search for the still missing Martin Bauman. Hitler's number three Nazi. Yes. And since the picture's been completed, Investigators have received evidence indicating that Borman is still alive. There are some very exciting stars in that picture. Dick Powell gives an outstanding performance as the American intelligence officer. And there's Vincent Price in one of those raw villain parts he does so well. Then there's the real villain of the piece, the Nazi, played by Stephen McNally. A newcomer to the screen. Uh-huh. A dark, dynamic type, Mr. Fury. <laughs> I understand, Livy. Then there's another interesting newcomer, too. And is she exciting? Martha Torn is the lovely Swedish actress all Hollywood's talking about. A really unique personality. And her performance in Rogue's Regiment may establish her as a top favorite. She's only 21, yet she's an accomplished actress. Beautiful, too. I'm sure John Kennedy will be happy to hear that Martha was enchanted to find she could get all the Lux toilet soap she wanted in this country. She still remembers how precious a tiny sliver was in her native Sweden. Say, Libby, she must really be pleased with that big new bath size cake. Utter luxury, she calls it. So she didn't know how delightful a beauty bath could be till she used that generous, fat and smooth bath cake. Lux girls everywhere agree on that. The new bath size gives lots more of the, the Lux soap lather. It really is luxurious. And the new bath cake has the flower-like fragrance screen stars love. The same exclusive blend of costly ingredients that has made the Lux Soap perfume famous. This generous new cake makes a wonderfully refreshing bath. Why not try it for your daily beauty bath? Let the whole family enjoy the new bath size Lux Toilet Soap, too. And now, here's Mr. William Keeley, our producer. Here's the second act of The Razor's Edge, starring Ida Lupino as Isabel and Mark Stevens as Larry with Joseph Kearns as Elliot Templeton and Edgar Barrier as Somerset Maugham. They were married and in less than a year, Isabel and Gray Maturin. I doubt if anyone was more pleased with this turn of events than Elliot Templeton. I must say they make a most attractive couple, Maugham. Uh, all's well that ends well. I hope they'll be happy. By the way, was that Sophie Nelson I saw a few minutes ago? Oh, Isabel's country cousin, yes. She's uh, married now to that lawyer fellow. Isabel insisted on inviting them to the wedding. Why, I don't know. Did she invite Larry Darrell? Are you trying to face me? You know very well Darrell's in Europe. Yes, I saw him last spring, Elliot. He mentioned something about going to Strasbourg and working in a coal mine. Working in a... Most undesirable young man. 
Now, about your plans, dear fellow, did I hear you say something about India? As a matter of fact, you did. I'll be in India by the first of the year. Well, look me up when you're back, old man. <laughs> Naturally, I shall be in Paris. It was in Strasbourg, as I subsequently learned, that Larry Darrell came to a great decision. He had made a friend, a fellow coal miner named Costi. <laughs> You're late for our glass of beer, Monsieur Darrell. Sorry, Costi. I've been over at the university. I've enrolled for a night course. Uh, you're a fool. Try to the man who wants to develop his brain work in a coal mine. I just wanted to, I suppose. Hiding out, Larry? Police after you? No. A woman, maybe? No, I just thought, well, a coal mine might do me good. And when you've had enough of it, you go back to America, huh? I suppose so. And do what? Sell stocks and bonds. But what about the answers to all your profound questions? Peace of mind, happiness, how to live? <laughs> Don't you know people have been asking those same questions for thousands of years? They can't help asking them. You know what you sound like, Larry? Like a very religious man who does not believe in God. I'm not sure I believe in anything. Look, have you ever thought of going to the East? India, for instance? India? I went there once. I met a very strange man, a saint. People from all over India go to him for guidance, for teaching. Did he help you? No. Well, that was not his fault. It was mine. How did you ever happen to go to India? To escape my pursuer. But I know however far I flee to India or, or to the black dip of a coal mine. One day he will come up with me. And I will feel that terrible hand on my shoulder. And why not stop running away? Whatever it is, why not take your punishment? Punishment? It is not prison of the hangman's rope. I could face that. It's mercy, forgiveness, love. I thought you knew. Knew what? Who I am. I am an unfrocked priest. It's not the police I'm running from. It's God. Now get out, you fool. Get out. I'm going to get drunk. A few weeks later, Larry Darrell arrived at a sort of monastery at the foot of the Himalaya Mountains in northern India. Why have you come here, my son? I've come to learn. Ever since the war, I've been searching for something. Something that I'm not able to put into words. In France, I met a Polish coal miner. He told me that, that you might help me. God is the only help. I've traveled, I've studied. I've read everything I could get my hands on, but nothing seems to satisfy me. And should you find what you are searching for? It will be something good. Something to be shared with others, but how to find it? Where? The whole world is like you, my son. Restless, confused. It will always be so, as long as men set their hopes on false ideas. The road to... True salvation is difficult to pass over. Difficult as the sharp edge of a razor. But this much we know. There is in every one of us a spark of the infinite goodness which created us. And when we leave this earth, we are reunited with it. As a raindrop falling from heaven is at last reunited with the sea which gave it birth. May I stay here? Will you help me? Of course you may stay. Our life is very simple here. There are books. We will talk together. You can work in the field if you wish. Thank you. Come, my son. I don't know if Larry Darrow ever thought of Isabel in the years that passed. For there in India, he was as one lost to the rest of the world. One day, he returned to the monastery from a solitary pilgrimage in the mountains. Eagerly, he sought out his venerable teacher. Well, my son? You remember what it was you told me the day I left here? I told you that sometimes, alone in that mountain, strange things may happen. Well, something very strange did happen to me. One morning, I suddenly awoke and walked out of the little hut. I just stood there on the mountaintop. And gradually, the light began to filter through the darkness, like some mysterious figure stealing through the trees. And then the first rays of the sun came up, the mountain, the mist caught in the treetops, 
I never felt or saw anything like it. I know. I felt that I'd been released from my body. And all the things that had been confused before suddenly became clear to me. I had a sense of knowledge more than human. I felt that I'd broken away and was free. I felt that if it lasted another moment, I'd... I'd die. And yet I was willing to die if I could just hold on to it. Because for that short time, I had the feeling... The feeling that... That... You and God were one. Yes. I'm going back there. I'm going back. No, my son. Your place now is with your own people. It's been given you to see the infinite beauty of the world, which is only the reflection of the beauty of God. That vision of beauty will remain with you, fresh and vivid, to the end of your days. Go now, my son. Go back to your world. Much had happened by the time Larry Darrell was once again in Paris. Our meeting in a little Italian cafe was entirely accidental, but I had considerable to tell him. And what about Elliot Templeton, Mr. Mom? Have you seen him lately? Oh, yes. He's given up his Paris home. He's taken a villa on the Riviera. All the better people are on the Riviera now. I, uh, I don't suppose you've had any news from home. That is, my home, Chicago. Some, Larry. For one thing, there's been a great stock market crash. Gray Maturin lost everything. But wise old Uncle Elliot sold short. He made a fortune. And what about Isabel? And Sophie and her beau? They were married, of course. Yes, they were married. They had a little girl. The husband and child were killed last year in an automobile accident. And Sophie? Elliot didn't know too much about it. Other than that, Sophie just about lost her mind. I understand she disappeared. No one knows where she is. Sophie... Now, what about Isabel? It may surprise you to know that Isabel and Gray and their two children are living not five miles from here. Here? In Paris? Isabel? After the crash, Gray had a nervous breakdown. He hasn't been well enough to work. Elliot's been very generous. He insisted they take over his home here. Oh, poor Gray. I should look them up. Now, suppose you let me ask some questions. What did you do in India, Larry? Well, I learned something about myself. I was very happy there. About Gray and Isabel, if you could give me their address... I'm Better yet, I'll meet you there this afternoon. Here's the address. Mr. Moore, how nice of you to drop in. Hello, Isabel. How's Gray? Oh, another one of his horrible headaches. He's lying down. Oh, what a pity. I was hoping you and Gray would dine with us tonight. I'd love to, but I don't see how we can... Did you say us? Yes. Larry Darrell is back in Paris. Larry? Larry Darrell? He lunched with me today. He'll be dropping in any minute. Larry. Where is he been? India. India? Do you realize I... I haven't seen him for years. Did you tell him we'd lost all our money? Yes. <laughs> Funny. When you come to think of it. Gray and I have almost exactly the income that Larry had. He asked me to marry him. And I wouldn't. Because we couldn't possibly live on it. I don't think you're so terribly to be pitied, my dear. If it weren't for Uncle Elliot, we'd... Oh, yes, sir. Excuse me, madame. Monsieur Darrell is calling. Isabel. Larry. Oh, Larry. I, I can't believe it. Hello, Isabel. Oh, Larry, let me look at you. You haven't changed. You haven't changed at all. Is his Gray home? And where are the children? Oh, I'd so like to show them off. Their nurse has taken them to the park. Gray's here in the library. Gray! Gray, dear, look. It's Larry Darrell. Larry? Hello, Gray. Oh, I'm glad to see you, Larry. As long as you caught me like this. Blinding headache. Gray, Mr. Moore wants to take us all out this evening. Do you feel up to it, Gray? Oh, I wish I could say yes, but... Go anyway, please. Wait a minute. Gray... Would you let me see if I can help you? How? Oh. Your headache. I... I might be able to help you. I'd like to talk to you. Well, sure. I think Dr. Darrell would like to be alone with his patient. Do you mind, Isabel? It won't take long. Oh, I can't 
understand it, Isabella. It's practically gone. My headache's gone. Larry, what on earth did you do? Well, he, he just talked to me, and then he told me to go to sleep, and, and I did. Whatever it was, Larry, you learned the trick in India, didn't you? Well, there's nothing so unusual about it. Sort of a hypnosis, I suppose. I merely put an idea into Gray's head that he would feel better. He did the rest himself. Larry, do you think you could cure him permanently? Well, I, I, I can't work miracles. But there's no reason why he couldn't cure himself in time. But that was a miracle. I know how miserable he felt. Can we reconsider dinner then? Oh, sure we can. I'd like to go out. Excellent. How do you know, Isabel? I'll phone for reservations. Where'd go, Isabel? I asked him to get my rent. What did you do with my husband? Well, Grace getting the car. I... I was watching you and Larry dance. Isabel. I know what you're thinking. Go on, say it. You're not going to be so silly as to fall in love with him again, are you? I've never stopped loving him. Never loved anyone else in my life. Grace, such a good fellow. It would be a pity to hurt him. I'll never do anything to hurt him. I'm too fond of him for that. Well, it's your business, not mine. Well, where shall we go now? Oh, how about the Rue de Lac? The Rue de Lac? What a neighborhood. But I've never been there. At least it'll be different. Please. Well, if you really want to go, of course. But I think you'll be sorry. It's dirty and it can be dangerous. Mm, that's ridiculous. Here they come. Gray, guess where we're going? The Rue de Lac. Sophie was as normal as any person I've ever known. Was she in love with you, Larry? Oh, good heavens, no. Just a skinny little girl with a ribbon in her hair. I remember her crying once when I was reading a note of Keith. Because it was so beautiful. All girls of that age are emotional. Yes. Yes, I suppose so. Well, I'd better be getting along. But don't run now, Larry. It's late, Isabel. And Gray here has better get some sleep. Oh, but I feel fine, really. Larry, we will see you. Of course, Isabel. 
Good night. Good night, Mr. Mom. Well, I should be going, too. I'll give you a lift, Larry. When I inquired of Larry where he was living, he asked me if I'd mind taking him instead to the Rue de la. I left him at the cafe with Sophie. Station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. KMX Los Angeles, both AM and FM. In a few moments, we'll continue with Act Three of The Razor's End. It's quite natural that our guest tonight should aspire to a movie career. Barbara Lyon is the daughter of B.B. Daniels and Ben Lyon, a famous couple long identified with the screen. Barbara, you know, you have something to live up to. I realize that, Mr. Keeley. That's why I'm working so hard in little theater plays. Since your father is an executive at 20th Century Fox, you probably visit the movie sets frequently. I spend every free moment there, because that's the way to learn picture technique. It's also a lot of fun. One movie I especially enjoyed watching was Apartment for Peggy. Now, I can understand that. The story was charm and humor and very timely, too. Didn't you love Jean Crane as a young wife? <laughs> and it's a made-to-order role for Jean. She and Bill Holden, as her G.I. husband, play a modern campus couple trying to get an education and find a place to live at the same time. Oh, they were lucky. They had Edmund Gwen to help them. He's a perfect dear as a disillusioned professor. Since Apartment for Peggy is another technicolor picture, I imagine John Kennedy enjoyed it for a special reason. How about it, John? Well, uh, Lux girls are always lovely. But when you see a camera close-up of Jean Crane in color... You know how gorgeous the Lux complexion can be, Mr. Kennedy. Right. Jean has unusually beautiful skin. And I know how carefully she protects it with Lux soap care. Well, she's like nine out of ten other Hollywood stars in this respect. Screen stars know how effective Lux soap facials can be. That's something I was taught in childhood. You see, Mother has always used Lux soap. Well, Barbara, complexions like yours make close-ups easy for the cameraman. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Here's proof for women everywhere that daily Lux soap care really works. In recent tests made by skin specialists, three out of four complexions became softer, smoother, in a short time. So why not use this fragrant white beauty soap regularly? Discover for yourself why Lux Toilet Soap is the choice of Hollywood's loveliest stars. Back now to our producer, William Keeling. The curtain rises on the third act of The Razor's Edge, starring Ida Lupino as Isabel and Mark Stevens as Larry. I saw nothing more of Isabel, Sophie, or Larry. Then one day, in answer to a telephone call, I rushed to Isabel's home. Idiot. Stupid blind idiot. If you'd calm down, Isabel, I might figure out what you're trying to tell me. He's going to marry. Larry is going to marry Sophie. How do you know? He called me on the phone. I'm frantic. Well, it's his own affair, isn't it? He says she stopped drinking. The fool thinks he's cured. Oh, that's possible. Have you forgotten what he did for Gray? Gray wanted to be helped. She doesn't. How do you know? Because I know women. She's no good. Do you think for one minute she'll stick to Larry? What's the matter with you? Do you think I'd sacrifice myself only to let Larry fall into the hands of a woman like that? How did you sacrifice yourself, Isabel? By giving Larry up. For one reason, because I didn't want to stand in his way. Come off it, Isabel. You gave him up for a square-cut diamond and a sable coat. Get out of here. Get out. I hate the sight of you. I'm sorry for that, Isabel. Because the sight of you always gives me great pleasure. You're beautiful. You're fascinating. And smart enough, I've always thought, to make the best of a bad job. No. Larry's in the grip of the most powerful emotion that can beset the breast of man. Self-sacrifice. He's got to save the soul of the wretched woman whom he knew as an innocent child. And there's nothing you or I can do to prevent it. But... He's going to be so miserable. Do you love him very much, Isabel? It's a nuisance, isn't it? I can't help it. Then why lose him altogether? Make friends with Sophie. You're beautiful. You're fascinating. And smart enough, I've always thought, to make the best of a bad job. No. 
Larry is in the grip of the most powerful emotion that can beset the breast of man. Self-sacrifice. He's got to save the soul of the wretched woman whom he knew as an innocent child. And there's nothing you or I can do to prevent it. But he's going to be so miserable. Do you love him very much, Isabel? It's a nuisance, isn't it? I can't help it. Then why lose him altogether? Make friends with Sophie. Be nice to her. Yes, I, I could ask her to lunch tomorrow. No, but I can't. Not after the awful things I said about her to Larry on the phone. If I ask her to lunch, will you behave? Oh, like an angel of light. One o'clock tomorrow at the Creon. Isabel, you're not catching up anything, are you? Don't be hateful. Just terribly curious to see what she looks like. Now that Larry's reformed her. Luncheon with a reformed alcoholic and a jealous girl can be something of a strain. Larry was the only calm one among us. There were cocktails on the table. They seemed to fascinate Sophie, but she spoke readily and openly of having stopped drinking entirely. Isabel actually behaved beautifully. She insisted on giving Sophie a Molyneux gown for her wedding dress. Sophie was to call at the house the next day, and Isabel would drive her to the shop for a fitting. I'm so glad you're early, Sophie. As long as the fitter can't see us until four, we can have a nice long talk. That's what I want, Isabel. Because there's something on my mind. You hate me for marrying Larry, don't you? Oh, I don't hate you at all. If I'd hate anyone or anything that came in the way of his happiness. I'll be a good wife, Isabel. I was before. Yes, I know you were. Would you like some tea, Sophie? No, thanks. What's in that bottle? That? Oh, it's called Tzofka. It's sort of Polish brandy. Uncle Elliot sent us a case of it yesterday. It's really wonderful. And to think I shall die without ever having tasted it. Don't you love the color? It's like the green you sometimes see in the heart of a white rose. Oh, poor soul. I have a great desire to drink it at all. But give me about two more weeks, though. I haven't had a drop since that night in the Rue de Lap. It must be awful. I mean, breaking off completely. All at once. Sometimes when I've been alone, I've wanted to shriek the house down. But this is my only chance. Larry's giving me my only chance. I know that. Excuse me, Madame the car is here. Oh, thank you, Marie. Sophie, my little girl's at the dentist. As long as I have time to pick her up, perhaps I'd better. Of course. Is that her picture, Isabel? Your little girl? Oh, this is my other one. This is Priscilla. She's seven. Linda. My baby, Linda, would have been nine in November. This November that's coming. Well, I won't be long, so... Linda. My baby. My baby. Isabel did not return till quite late. By then, Sophie was gone, and the bottle of Terzovka was empty. Four days later, Larry finally found her. She was back in the Rue de Lap and worse than ever. There was a fight when Larry tried to take her out of the place. He was badly beaten. When he recovered consciousness, Sophie had disappeared. That was the last I saw or heard of her until almost a year later, when I received an urgent telegram from the police department of the city of Toulon. How good of you to come here, Monsieur Moore. Well, I will not beat around the bush. Here is a book. Another. You recognize it? I ought to, Inspector. I wrote it. Did you also write the inscription here on the flyleaf? I... Yes, I did. I gave this book to Sophie Nelson several years ago in Chicago. Have you found her? We have found her. She has been murdered. What? We fished her body out of the harbor. The throat was cut from ear to ear. Monsieur, how does it happen that a person of your age of respectability should be acquainted with such a character? I knew her very slightly. Your book was found in her room. Monsieur, we wish merely to establish a few facts about her and uh, arrange for a burial. Of course. I don't expect that. Come in, monsieur. 
Hello, Mr. Mon. Well, they sent for you, too. Have they told you? Yes, it's dreadful. I've been at the morgue. I had to identify her. Well, messieurs, we think we know who perpetrated this crime. Finding him may be another matter. Meanwhile, if you uh, care to arrange a funeral, I can give you the necessary authorization. We, we'd like to very much. So, Evans, I have a personal friend who is an undertaker. Very reasonable, messieurs. Here, his card. Thank you. May I see where she lives? Follow me. I shall be happy to take you there. The deceased apparently had occupied this room for about five months. Mr. Mom, look. Yes. Ah, yes, that photograph. A man and a child. You know who they are? Her husband and her baby. Oh, where are they now? Dead. A long time ago. Could the picture be buried with her? If you wish, monsieur. Poetry. She still had this book of poetry. An ode of Keats. I read this to her when she was just a little girl. Fades the sight of beauty from my eyes. Fades the shape of beauty from my arms. Fades the voice, warmth, whiteness, paradise. Vanished unseasonably at shut of ease. After the funeral, Larry came with me to Nice to call on Elliot Templeton. I had heard from Isabel that Elliot was very ill. Uncle Elliot, you have visited. Look, Elliot. Oh, my dear fellow. How very nice to see you. And Larry. Well, this is a surprise. Mr. Mom said you were sick. Did he? Well, I am sick. But you don't look. You look extremely well. Well, really, now. That's the most sensible thing I've ever heard you say. I've got the Grand Duke lunching with me on Sunday, and I've told my doctor he must put me to rights by then at all costs. Oh, too bad this should have happened just now. It's a particularly brilliant season. Are you going to Princess Nova Molly's party? Of course not. Has she asked you? <laughs> She's asked everybody in Europe, Larry. She's giving a great do. Fancy dress. Fancy dress. She hasn't asked me. It's a deliberate insult. Come now, Elliot. Why should she want to insult you? It's just an oversight. I'm not a man that people overlook. Well, perhaps she doesn't know you're in the south of France. Don't be ridiculous. Everybody knows I'm in the south of France. It's going to be the best party of the season. If I were on my deathbed, I'd go to it. Never mind, old boy. It may rain the night of the party. That'll ruin it. You know, I never thought of that. I shall pray for rain as I have never prayed before. The old witch. She never got anywhere if it hadn't been for me. Now she doesn't invite me to the greatest party of her career. Fireworks, my dear fellow. They're going to be fireworks. So unkind, I hate them. I hate them all. They've eaten my food and they've drunk my wine. I've run their errands for them and I've made their parties for them. And what have I got out of them? Got nothing. Now that I'm old and sick, they have no use for me. They don't care whether I live or die. Not one of them. So cruel. I wish I'd never left America. Earlier. Go out. Go out, please. I... I'll be carried away. You must not see me like this. Come back later, please. Well, of course. Mr. Mom, I know Princess Nova Malley's secretary. I think I can do something about that invitation. It would make him feel so much better. You're not leaving, Larry. I'll be back later. Where, where did he go, Mom? Larry. Oh, I don't know, Elliot. I imagine he'll be back. I didn't tell you before. The bishop was here today. The bishop himself. Great honor. Now I shall enter the kingdom with a letter of introduction from the prince of the church. I'm I'm afraid you'll find the company very mixed. Don't you believe it? I shall pick and choose my company there, as I always have. Where's Isabel and Gray? We're here, dear. Oh, now, now, if you're going to make a scene, Isabel, leave my room. Oh, Uncle Elliot. Gray, I understand you have a job in prospect. Yes, if I can raise enough money to start up my father's old firm again. I do have the money now, my boy. I'm a rich man. 
I've left you and Isabel everything I have. But you're um, I beg your pardon. But this note just arrived for Mr. Templeton. Oh. Mom, read it to me. Why, it's an invitation. Princess Nova Marley's party. There, didn't I tell you? Have you got a piece of paper? Yes, Ellie. I want to reply. Not now, Uncle Elliot. Please. I've always been a man of the world. There's no reason why I should forget my manners as I'm leaving it. Mr. Elliot Templeton regrets he cannot accept the Princess Nova Marley's kind invitation owing to a previous engagement with his blessed law. You witch. That night, Larry Darrell told Isabel he was leaving at once for Cherbourg. There was a boat sailing for New York. What are you going to do when you get there, Larry? Oh, I thought I might take a job in a factory or a garage. I don't know. Might even buy a taxi. Taxi? Why not? It's a good life. You're always on the go. Meet a lot of different people. Oh, Larry, for heaven's sake. Just look what you've done with your life. And with mine. What are you trying to prove? I'd, I'd hope you'd come back to the States with us. Gray's going into business again. He'll need all the help he can get. Gray's all right, Isabel. He doesn't need me. But Larry, suppose he does. Suppose something goes wrong again. He has another breakdown. You can't imagine what he went through the last time. I honestly believe that if it hadn't been for the children, he'd have killed himself. Well, that's the wonderful thing about life, Isabel. Most of us always get a second chance. I got a second chance right at the moment when I thought there was nothing in the world worth living for. Do you know what it means to see another man give up his life for you? To walk the streets at night knowing that someone deliberately died so that you might go on living? You asked me that question some years ago. I didn't understand then. I don't know. And I told you I didn't think I'd ever find myself. Well, I haven't yet, completely. Oh, I found some of the things I was looking for. And someday I may find them all. But I know what lies ahead, Isabel. I know where I'm going. And Gray, in his own way, can do the same thing. Because this is his second chance. What about me? Doesn't it mean anything to you that I love you? That I've never loved anyone else but you? That my children might have been your children? Look at me, Larry. You know you love me. You know that. You've always wanted me. Say it's true. Say you know it's true. Oh, Larry, I love you. I love you. Please promise you'll come back with us. Promise you. Tell me about Sophie, Isabel. Sophie? That afternoon, she came to your house. Did she have anything to drink? Yes. She helped herself. I had to leave to pick up my daughter at the dentist. But when you found Sophie gone in the box empty, weren't you surprised? I thought she got tired of waiting. When I noticed the bottle, I thought the butler had drunk it. They nearly spoke to him about it. You never were a very good liar, Isabel. You don't believe me? Not for a moment. All right. You want the truth, you can have it. I did it, and I'd do it again. I was determined to stop at nothing to prevent her marrying you. Nobody else would do a thing they didn't care. Oh, Larry, you men are such fools. I knew that sooner or later she'd break down and stuck out a mile. You saw how jittery she was. I knew she'd give her soul for a drink. I made up my mind that if I found Sophie had not touched the bottle, I'd make the best of things and try to be friends with her. Now, that's true. I swear it. And when I came back and saw the bottle was empty, I knew I'd been right all along. That's pretty much what I thought. Sylvie's dead, Isabel. Dead? In Toulon. She'd been murdered. Oh, horrible. Do you know who did it? No. But I do. There's no need to be shocked about Sophie any longer, Isabel. I've had a feeling all day that Sophie is where she'd want to be most. With Bob and Linda. Oh, I know it's a very simple way to look at it. But it's comforting. Goodbye, Isabel. And take good care of Gray. He needs you now. More than ever. Mr. Mom. Good. And I love him. I love him so tenderly. But now I'm 
Do you think you'll ever see him again? It isn't likely. His America will be as remote from yours as the Gobi Desert. Oh, it's all so crazy. So useless. What is he trying to do with his life? What does he hope to find? My dear, Larry has found what we all want. And very few of us ever get. I don't think anyone can fail to be better and nobler, kinder for knowing him. You see, my dear, goodness is, after all, the greatest force in the world. And he's got it. Before our stars to thank for their curtain call, here's news for every man and woman who would like a new car. Lever Brothers Company is giving away 30 brand new 1949 Mercuries in their sensational $100,000 Mercury a Day contest. Get in the contest now and win a beautiful all-new 1949 Mercury four-door sedan. There are lots of chances to win because there's a new contest every day. A new Mercury given away every weekday, Monday through Friday, until November 19th. Plus... $110 cash prizes every day. 3,030 prizes in all. Here's what you do. Finish this statement in 25 words or less. I like Lux Toilet Soap because... With your letter, include wrapper from a cake of Lux Toilet Soap and your name and address and mail to Lever's Mercury a Day Contest. Post Office Box 3, New York, New York. Enter as often as you please. Your storekeeper has free entry blanks with complete rules. Residents of the continental United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, are eligible. Get the whole family to enter. Just enclose a Lux toilet soap wrapper with every letter, and be sure to include your storekeeper's name. I'll repeat that address. Lever's Mercury a Day Contest, Post Office Box 3, New York, New York. Don't miss this exciting contest. You may be a lucky winner. We return you now to William Keeling. Another distinguished drama for the Lux Radio Theater. And back to the footlights, we bring the stars responsible. Ida Lupino and Mark Stevens. <laughs> to a busy schedule in pictures, Ida tells me she's just added a hobby, painting. Ida, you've come to the right place. Bill Keeley is a collector of contemporary American painting. Maybe you can make a sale. Well, I don't think he'd want to buy my kind of painting. What's your field, Ida? Portraits? No. Maybe it's landscape. No. Oh, then it must be still life. No, I'm just painting the living room. <laughs> well, isn't that rather hard on that beautiful Lux complexion of yours, Ida? Well, Bill, I never worry about it because I've used Lux soap as a complexion care for a long time. Bill, what play is Lux presenting next Monday evening? A dramatic hit from the top drawer at Metro Golden Mayor. It's The Secret Heart. And from the original screen cast, we'll bring you one of our favorite stars, Walter Pidgeon. And playing opposite him, the brilliant dramatic actress, Deborah Carr. Our play is a love story told with power and sincerity. The perfect vehicle for the superb talents of Walter Pidgeon and Deborah Carr. Now, we're looking forward to hearing The Secret Heart, Bill. Good night. Good, Good night, night, and thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, next Sunday, October 24th, is United Nations Day, a day for all Americans to consider their future and their children's future. Does that future hold the horrible holocaust of another war, or does it hold enduring peace to the United Nations? Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Walter Pigeon and Deborah Carr in The Secret Heart. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Ida Lupino will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox picture, Roadhouse, co-starring with Cornell Wilde. 
Mark Stevens appears through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of When My Baby Smiles at Me, starring Betty Grable and Dan Daly. Heard in our cast tonight were Edgar Barrier as Somerset Mom, Joseph Kearns as Templeton, Francis Robinson as Sophie, and Jeff Chandler, Herbert Butterfield, Bill Johnstone, Eleanor Audley, Alex Gary, Rolf Sedan, and Eddie Marr. Our music was directed by Louis Silver. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Walter Pigeon and Deborah Carr in The Secret Heart. Richer tasting cakes. Spry tops any other type shortening. Spry's amazing cake improver takes guesswork and hard work out of cake making. Try Spry's one bowl method for glorious cakes. For all you bake and fry, rely on Spry. S P R Y. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Secret Heart, starring Walter Pigeon and Deborah Carr. Stay tuned for my friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. KNX Los Angeles, both AM and FM. 25 seconds before 8 p.m., D-U-L-O-V-A, Bulova Watch time. Bulova invites you to see His Excellency, America's greatest watch value, leader of your jeweler's 1948 watch parade. If you like good drama, remember this, Rosalind Russell and Mrs. Parkington at 8, and the first night are at 8.30. That's next Thursday night.